right we are live hi everyone i'm really excited to interview keen wongsley he is currently software architect at autodesk research i have been following keen's development through his blogs and twitter posts and it's so inspiring and first of all i must admit that the the developments he has been part of at autodesk is cutting edge and every time i look at his post it inspires me to do to do more development so thanks a lot keen for your time to do this thank you maya thank you thank you very much for in, for inviting me along i'm happy to be talking to to you and and to your audience as well yeah so from my research i got to know that you were at bangalore for some time so do you yes. miss bangalore food or traffic so i don't miss the traffic though honestly you know the last time i went back was 4 years ago which had been a long time since i'd been and you know just the cha- the, the i mean the traffic is always worse but mobility has improved so much in the sense you know you have uber and and what's the one that does uh, auto rickshaws as well uh anyway Ola. there's yeah ola there you go so so there's so there's a number of these you know ride sharing um services that that came up i mean when when i lived in bangalore is at the turn of the millennium right so it, or a little after that it was like 2003 to 2005 so the best thing we had um was a you know city taxi you'd be able to call and you'd get up like these these pop up kind of i used to think these toaster vans like the the really thin ones that you'd jump in and be able to get across town but um it was always getting around was always a mess um i did and this is a really funny thing um you'll laugh at this i actually the the when when we arrived in bangalore i bought an ambassador um an old an old taxi cuz i just Ooh. really really liked those cars and i knew that it was also a car that i wouldn't be tempted to kind of just get in and drive across town which would be a big mistake in bangalore mm-hmm. so i bought an undrivable car and then we kind of had a sequence of drivers that really didn't work out very well because nobody yeah. you know nobody wants to be a part-time driver so we yeah we mostly use city taxis to get around yeah anyway that's a bit of fun but yeah i definitely miss the food um i'm half indian so so i do eat indian food um my wife is swiss but she's she she knows how to cook indian food and we do eat indian food quite regularly uh, luckily she she loves it as well so um but yeah that's that it is it's going to be the food rather than the traffic <laughs> i see and you have more than 26 experience, years of experience working at autodesk and you have a computer science background so my first question is like what got you interested into ac um right so it, it, i didn't join autodesk in an aec centric role so when i joined autodesk um in 1995 it was actually because i had experience in two areas that were of interest at the time so one i'd done a fair amount of autocad development which could be ac but you know it's not necessarily ac so i i knew a lot about autocad programming but actually my first job was involved in in supporting a product called work center which was an early document management solution that we had so i'd kind of worked with both of those so i i i got started um with work center and i was providing developer support so that meant answering te- you know programming questions um giving training on on the api to the product and then also traveling and speaking at conferences and you know sort of evangelizing the 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 technology if you like um and that was across so so i started with work center but i over the years you know i worked with i haven't worked with mechanical cad so much but i did work with some gis software that we had called autodesk world back in the day i also spent some time quite a lot of time with with autocad architectural desktop or autocad aec now um so i i spent a lot of time working with the omf and and things like that um which the omf is the object modeling framework which is a, an nsdk or api for 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 autocad aec um and so yeah i've been um the, i i guess i eased into it through through or you know architectural desktop really that's how i i got became more familiar with the with the domain um and then 
Yeah, eventually, I suppose, I've ended up spending more time focused on AEC than anything else. Um, but I still struggle with architectural terminology and domain knowledge. So that's one thing that, that you all have, um, a, you know, a lot more of, of course, than, than, than I do, for sure. I yeah. see. And like, comparing like, other industry with uh, AEC, like, I'm curious to know your opinion on, like, is it messy? What are like areas of improvement? Like, what we could do differently? Oh well, I you know that's really. I mean, I it's really not for me to to judge in that sense. I mean, you you hear the usual um, sort of cliched uh, remarks about um, you know fragmentation in the industry and you know. The, the, these sort of problems, but I, I'm not um, familiar enough with, you know, customer workflows at that level that I can judge. I mean, I, I, I see lots of um, opportunity to, to sort of solve problems, but I don't tend to, um, I, you know, I can't really say that things are, are fundamentally broken because I don't have that, that perspective or vision on the, on the bigger picture for AEC. Sad. I, uh, <laughs> yeah. I totally understand and it's like a very complex world so can you give us like high level overview about highlights of your projects you did in your career yeah i mean i've, I've got you know I, i've it's there's lots of things that i've you know i've gone down such strange tech technology rabbit holes over the years just exploring things and a lot of the time it's around uh, adjacencies so you know you sort of see things in one space that you think oh that could apply here as well and you start to explore a bit um, you know and, and it, it goes from things like starting to look at, at, at fractals and Lindemeyer you know uh, what, what do they call them L, L script anyway um, anyway the, the, these very the, the scripts that generate um, organic shapes, bringing those into AutoCAD to create geometry and sort of random trees, uh, you know, connecting a connect sensor into AutoCAD to bring in point clouds and to explore the possibility of gesture input in 3D, as well as reality capture as well directly in, in, into the tools. Um, yeah, so I mean, lots of things have got me interested over the years and I've kind of gone down these 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 rabbit holes really where and, and I've been lucky to have been in in a position where I've been able to explore um, explore these these you know sometimes quite niche areas uh, which has been just fantastic because I'm very um, well you know I I, I I really like to to move around and to to think about different things and to 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 keep stimulated in that way. Uh, I tend to be, um, I uh, you know, I don't know if th this is probably a bit facetious, but you know, I tend to be a little attention deficit when it comes to technology. You know, I sort of get get a little bored if I'm I'm always doing the same thing. Now, having said that, you know, I have had periods of my career at Autodesk where, I've, you know, my job has been focused on certain areas for a long time such as you know spending quite a lot of time with dasher etc but i've always found you know time to explore different things on top of that i would say yeah i see and like when you're <clears throat> when you're approaching a new field like of your interest is there a recipe you follow for quick learning or like how do you approach because it could be overwhelming and yeah. Well, yes. I mean, I don't know if there's a, a process, but I, I, it's a little opportunistic in the sense that I'll look for some existing sample or code or, or something that goes, you know, a major part of the distance that I want to go. And I'll look at sort of cross-purposing it or integrating it. Um, you know, good examples relate to, to Connect, you know, uh, this is before there was an official SDK back in 2008 I think there was a kind of a, a bit of a hacking community built up around Kinect so I found what really got me interested was that I found a few samples that showed how to access the point cloud data from a Kinect you know the, the depth data um, and, and I've, I tried multiple sort of 
different ways to do it until I found one that seemed stable and worked well. And then eventually Microsoft came out with an official SDK for that. So, um, but that was really, you know, I, 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 I'm not so uh, passionate or focused that I would start to build my own, uh, you know, device driver or start to read data from a port or things like that. I tend not to, I tend to re require a certain level of abstraction before I can comfortably engage with it. So um, I need it, you know, I typically need some high, you know, working sample, which is fairly straightforward to, to get going. And then I can adapt from there really. Um, so yeah, it, but, it, but it's often driven by the availability of something that, that I can try and, and and that's the same even today you know you'll see things on on Twitter where you're you're you know I mean like eight bit computing bots you know you can you, on on Twitter you can tweet code f f you know in BBC basic uh, and it'll compile it and and you know I spend a you know half day enjoying digging up old BBC basic samples and tweeting them to BBC microbot and seeing them compile and run and things like that it's just really really fun but but you know i need some um some base level of, of availability before i can really start to research something and, and make use of it i think i see and um that also ties back to your earlier point of like having curiosity and if you implement that it gives also like that feedback loop okay to try more things and seeing the ideas you have being implemented gives you more confidence or joy so. yeah no absolutely and also the the engagement from the community as well you know if you're doing all this stuff in isolation and people are like oh you know you're, or no nobody really knows you're doing it, it's hard at least well some some people uh, have more intrinsic motivation to do work i would say but i also i find that i get extremely motivated by feedback you know by people telling me wow this is really interesting um you know and engaging in in that sense so i think having having that feedback loop with uh, a community of people i mean i started my blog really to um ed help educate people and to help give, give people tools to work with with autocad and its net api that's where it really started because there wasn't um the documentation at the time was a bit lacking and and I was really excited about this technology that, that I thought would be relevant and, and useful to people. Um, so I started really to, to try and help people. But over time, um, I found that, that the engagement with the community helped really sort of propel me forward and motivate me to, to keep going. And, you know, and that was 16 years ago. So, you know, and, and of course, I've completely changed topics in the meantime. I, I very rarely use AutoCAD these days, but... Um, but there's, you know, there's always something else that that interests me and seems to interest people out, you know, out there as well. I see. And I must commend, like, having consistency in blogging and sharing is also important because there's always like good exciting phase and then there's like boring phase. You might not get that response, but still you gotta continue. So, uh, was there any low point? during this whole journey or something yeah it's not always been easy in the sense i mean so back in the day when i started you know we kind of had guidelines from our social media team who, who didn't really necessarily i mean it was all early days of blogging so we were all guessing a little bit um but we were kind of told you know you've got to do three posts a week you know that's kind of the you know the right number um and so i was like well okay and so I kind of stuck with that more or less. I mean, over the, over the years, for sure, there've been weeks where I've done two and there've been one or two weeks where I've done four or five, but, you know, mostly I do try and keep, um, keep on top of it and to keep some level of, con you know, consistency and engage, you know, to encourage engagement. Um, it's not, I mean, th there are tools that you can use to do that. I mean, if you're in a really large complex topic, then breaking it up into, into parts is a good way to sort of, you know, serialize it out and to sort of keep people engaged that way. Um, but yeah, sometimes my work is, you know, it, it's been really hard to find the time to do blog posts when I'm working on things that I can't really talk about. Um, and so that has been the most, that, that, that's that been one challenge. Luckily with, with Dasha, a lot of the things I've been doing, I've been able to talk about because it's, 
relevant to other forge developers so i found ways to you know to use that um to be able to fuel blog posts if you like but one other period which was challenging in a different way was um when i took when my wife and i took our kids out of school for six months um back in 2017 late 2017 anyway we did a six month round the world trip and that's when i was last in bangalore actually um but that was a period so i was still working for autodesk part-time during that trip which was kind of hard um but i was also blogging so i ended up blogging about the trip which was is, is a little bit off topic for for my blog it became a travel blog for six months um but yet yeah, it had kind of had a bit of a different audience and people read people responded and in, engaged with it for that period and then lost interest when i started talking about technology again um but that was kind of interesting so i said so yeah and i didn't get too many people complaining i did have one one guy comment on linkedin saying this is not facebook you know you shouldn't do personal posts <laughs> and i'm like well you know it's how I syndicate my blog content. I know it's personal, but you know, some people would be, there are people who would be unhappy if I just sort of, you know, didn't make it available through the way they consume, you know, consume, consume my content. So that's, that's just how it was. It was only one complaint I've had in all those years about, you know, that sort of thing. Um, and then, then more recently with the pandemic, um, I, you probably will have noticed I spend my Friday posts, um, you know, talking about Commodore 64s and 60, you know, 8-bit uh, computing technology, which is really just a bit of fun. But it, it also seems to be um, something that at least a, a small subset of, of my readership is interested in, at least. And so I, you know, I, I'll keep doing that for a few more a few more months and then we'll wrap it up at episode episode 64 i think so yeah i see and like i feel community building is very difficult like mm. and also once you start creating content your interests change with time so depending on that the audience uh, might not align with that so like even your community is constantly shifting and evolving so I, I totally can relate to that. But I was just wondering, like, what, what, what is exciting you at this moment? Because I have seen your talks on generative design, VR, AR, visualization. So what excites you at this moment? So it's, that's interesting. I mean, most of where I'm spending my time at the moment is around, you know, digital twins and you know dis displaying visualizing iot or sensor data in in the context of a 3d model um so that's where i'm having uh, you know spending most of my time so project dasher is is the main thing um but you know i also i i also do spend time on generative design it's still a topic that is very much interesting for me and i think that there's this fantastic opportunity to connect the two worlds you know in the sense that i think as we uh, as, as, as we capture all this real world performance data via sensors, et cetera, or cameras, et cetera, you know, feeding that data into the design process is going to be extremely valuable, you know, so that we can more optimally engineer, uh, you know, the next iteration or next generation of, of, of product or object or building, et cetera. Um, so I think that there is a huge opportunity uh, related to exactly that you know connecting digital twins and 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 sensors etc to both the typical traditional design process and generative design as well because i think that you know clearly that data could be valuable if you, if you have really accurate load information or stress information um coming from sensors you know you know you can start really to use that as part of generative design as well because you have this this real world data that that is is valuable so i think that it's nice that there is this kind of um continuum there or there's connect a connection um i'm still interested in vr and of course vr plays a role or can play a role um in in this space as well because visualize it, you know a lot of it's about you know visualizing future possibilities around design so there, there is a part of me that would like to be spending more time on vr but i kind of keep involved enough that that 
I'll, I can get back into it if I need to, but for the moment, it's a little bit set to one side, I would say. Yeah. I mean, there's other areas that have me interested, but I just really haven't had the chance to kind of engage, whether it's related to, uh, you know, blockchain, um, which I think has a, a lot of a lot of interesting potential. So I'm, I kind of keep a little bit track of what's going on there. The same with with AI and machine learning, where I've dabbled in the past, um, but I really don't. You know, it's not it's not an area that I've had the chance to focus. Um, you know, significantly recently. So I think you know, and and, and all of these, it's it's good to have a. Um, understanding of, of how they work and where the potential is. And I think that that's probably enough for me for now. Um, but yeah, there's a, there's just, yeah, there, there aren't quite enough hours in the day to keep you know, <laughs> become expert in everything. Right. Yeah. And, and especially like fields like blockchain, AI require some like background knowledge and like technical study to get a better understanding of it. And yeah. I was just thinking about the point you mentioned earlier, where if you have like some decent understanding of a field, then you can start thinking about how we can leverage multiple fields to find opportunities for the next product development. Yeah, and I, and I think that's really where uh, where innovation comes from. Typically, it's like you know, the, it's these adjacencies, it's these connections between fields and and, and applications. Um, you know, th those are the things where you, you really start to see uh, very interesting possibilities. And I think that that's, that, that's you know, so it is, it, it's, it's, it's good to have this broad uh, appreciation for, for different areas um, because that's where you'll identify opportunity, I think. Yeah. yeah. So I attended like recently a conference called NYC NFT. And oh, yes. Which made like a big news and every session like the speaker asked like what's your definition of community and it's like the whole like that development is very community driven and i was thinking about the earlier discussion about how in the blog post you also need like community engagement so it's we are moving towards like a community owned platform compared to like one to many so it's interesting area yeah no for sure um and and you know there are you know, we're lucky in a sense that there is this kind of vibrant community of people who are interested in, you know, architectural technology and, and the application of, of technology in this space. So I'm, I'm yeah, it's, it's, I, I've had one, <clears throat> excuse me, one kind of one to many uh, engagement kind of, you know, I, I do tend to create a fair amount of content. I'm not always very good at keeping on top of what other people are doing but i do my best to to make sure it isn't just like a, 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 a me being a mouthpiece but so so i you know i do scan you know twitter and and linkedin particularly on a fairly regular basis to 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 try and keep on top of of, of stuff that's happening yeah i see and like can you walk us through like start to end a uh, cycle of one of the projects you did um, yeah, so that's, uh, let's think about this. There's, um, we could probably talk a little bit about, about Dasha, which is probably the, again, the one that's, that's, I'm, I'm most, most involved in um, at the moment. What's interesting is that it started a long time ago, and it's probably not finishing anytime soon. So it's start to finish is a tricky, tricky one. Um, but it actually had a long history before I, I, I joined the team. Um, you know, it started in to that late 2009 when um, some researchers, particularly sort of Azam Khan, Alex Tessier and, and, and Ram Tinata, put their heads together and was, were thinking about a certain industry trends and how they might have an impact on the built environment. So they're, they're looking at, at um, the sort of decrease in cost of, of cloud storage. Um, they're looking at the increasing ubiquity and miniaturization of sensor technology, you know, so, you know, those coming down in cost as well. And they're saying to themselves, well, what would the potential be if we went in and measured absolutely everything we could 
in in a building um you know what could we find out about the way it performs how could we you know make it more efficient but and, and all you know multiplying that out across all the buildings on the planet you know what is the opportunity to to help you know reduce the impact of of the built environment on the climate and, and perhaps even you know reduce climate change so this was like a big um aspirational goal to say well what could we what could we do you know dasha was always about sustainability you know when it started and um, so you know they they spent um you know they, they had a uh, at times quite a large team focused on dasha building out this desktop infrastructure and back-end database infrastructure to store the the um, sensor data in a time series database um <clears throat> when i when i joined you know and the, and the product itself was or the, the project itself was was successful you know we had a number of various pilot a uh, various number of pilot projects um when i joined the research team at the beginning of 2016 um i uh, had already worked with with forge um and the precursor to forge the view and data api for several years and i had quite a lot of familiarity with the forge viewer and and the back end services that that enabled um, you know, forge viewer applications. So I, I, I was asked, you know, would I be interested in in building this sort of front, this new front end to Dasher, sort of maybe to breathe a bit of life in the project, um, <clears throat> and 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 test out whether it there would there was some potential for using Forge as an environment for digital twins. You know, we didn't call them digital twins. Um, that term was not. I, it was kind of was in use but you know we've we've started using it more i'm still not super comfortable using it because once again it's a little bit of a buzzword i mean but as you've as you mentioned you know my 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 life is a is is all about buzzwords really mm -hmm. um but yeah so we we thought about it as a building debugger you know, something that allowed you to go in and really, you know, understand what was going wrong with your building and, and fix it. Um, but yeah, so I had this uh, opportunity to do that. And I had, I was part of a really small team um, working on the front end. So, you know, my, my main partner in crime was Simon Breslov. He was a, you know, other developer who was, who I worked really closely with. Um, and then Halle, Halle Larson as well, who was involved in, as, as more of a sort of project management role um, and product management in a sense, you know, she helped sort of drive a lot of the, the feature development work. Um, so, you know, with this small team, we were able to, very quickly kind of build out um, the, you know, the, 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 well, let's call it Dasher 360, which makes it sound a bit like a product. So I would, I tend not to use that. We talk about Project Dasher. We built out the the Forge-based client for Project Dasher um, over, over the space of, you know, well, we moved very quickly, you know, Forge brought a huge amount of, of you know, um, interesting capability that we did, you know, that we didn't have to rebuild, you know, in terms of, loading the model and pr providing the visualization around it um and so we we found ways to integrate you know a lot of the work that had been done previously on dasha that simon had also been involved in so he he, he was kind of the, uh, the connect connective tissue between the the two eras of, of dasha if you like um so he you know we were able to bring across uh you know the, the low-level shaders that did uh, surface shading on on rooms. We were able to Im find a mechanism to to implement um, sprites, uh, you know, via a point cloud inside inside Dasher. So we had various things that we were able able to sort of build out of, over this over the course of a few years. Um, it wasn't, you know, we haven't had a highly structured environment for the project, and that's. Honestly, the way I prefer to work is is not part of a large team with um, you know uh, regular meetings, etc. I mean, I would meet, re but or even formal sprints, etc. I mean, it was it was a little fast and loose, some might say, um, compared to a more traditional software development process. But you know that it it, it was effective for you know with the team that we had. Um, and I was very happy with with how that has progressed. Um, and you know now, uh, you know it's an interesting thing. You know, Dasha is 
a, a long running project, um, but it's now, I think it's really now that it's becoming relevant in that sense, you know, that I, it has, you know, I think it's inspired a lot of activity in this space. Um, it's inspired a lot of people to come and ask us for similar technology, which is which has actually launched, uh, you know, the data visualization extension, which we talked about briefly earlier, you know, Project Hyperion, um, which is a, um, you know, which is essentially a piece of pieces of Dasher that have been taken out and made available to Forge developers who are using the viewer. Uh, so, so that is very much a, a res, you know consequence of the Dasher project, I would say. And to some degree, Tandem is as well. I mean, it solves a, a different piece of the of the problem, which is highly complementary to to Dasher, which I'm super excited about. Um, but now they're looking at, at, at implementing Dasher-like features inside Tandem, and they'll use the data visualization extension or Hyperion to do, to do just that. So pieces of Dasher will end up directly inside Tandem. Um, so that's, uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's interesting because Dasher will probably continue as a research project as well, because there's always going to, well, at least at the moment, I can see plenty of adjacent areas that are still a little too early to, to be built into a, into a sort of a product, uh, as it were. But um, we can sort of prove out using various APIs that are available either to, to Forge or to Tandem. Uh, so I think there's lots for us to do um, in this space. And, and I, I think we'll end up using these learnings to build out more um, digital twins as well. You know, I have in my, when I have my other hat on, which is a senior manager of a, of a small team inside research, a number of the guys that are, that are in my team are focused on digital twins, but more in the manufacturing space. So it's quite exciting because technology that we've developed in one area can you know work very well for the other and vice versa. So we're starting to build out a very interesting toolbox of capabilities for uh, you know digital, digital twins that work across industries. Yeah. So I don't know if that really answers your question. It's a very long-winded answer, um, but you know maybe we can get into more specifics if there's things that I've said that that you know you want to dig into. Yeah, I, I think this really helps how like Dasher is related to all other projects, and I I was wondering like from your experience in research, like it's how do you identify the need of the market or the practice as while working on the research like how do you have a holistic understanding of the problem well yeah well, i mean that's I, I you know i can't claim to be very adept at that myself like i don't i don't see myself as a as a visionary or um you know even even somebody who's very good at predicting the future you know, otherwise I'd have bought Bitcoin when, you know, back <laughs> many years ago, et cetera. But, you know, I'm not really, um, I'm not really uh, that, that attuned to what's coming. But, you know, the good news is, at least for me in, in the team that I'm in, is that we do have, you know, a team of people who are focused on strategic foresight inside, you know, inside the company and, you know, inside the research division even. Um, and they are uh, much better at sort of, and you know, taking a look at trends, higher level trends that will impact impact the industry. So there, there's some things come down from them. Down, I don't know if it's the right word, but come from them. Um, there's also definitely bottom up innovation for people who are really at the cutting edge in their particular fields. You know, we we have many many PhDs in the in the in research, of course, who are um, really focused in on a very specific area. Um, I tend to float around as a bit of a generalist and get involved in, in projects and contribute in, in my own way, but I'm not not really the person who's who's initiating the innovation or sort of driving it. I tend to be a bit of an enabler really um, for, for the things that happen. So I don't really have a, a, a magic answer. I mean, other than, you know, the areas where I have done things that I think are quite innovative have been really around this uh, 
sort of adjacency thing you know where 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 are things happening in one space that have not yet happened in another but you could see will you know have relevance there yeah i see and like based on your like different roles at autodesk what are some lessons learned in this journey oh that's a big question um well, I've had a kind of a non-traditional um, career path in that sense. And I can't say that I've made all the right decisions over the years. Um, you know, so maybe let's backtrack and I'll sort of just people who don't don't know my background. I mean, I, so as I said, computer science back, um, graduate. Um, I was involved in our developer network team for 17 years. So, you know, that's a long time. Um, so I started off doing more technical work and then I managed, uh, uh, you know, had the opportunity to be a, a manager of a team in, in the Bay Area for, for three years. And then, as, you, as, you, as we talked about earlier, I moved to India for two years and then um, was senior manager for that whole group, mostly of technical people. And that's when that, that's about the time I started my blog, because I was getting a little bit too far away from the technology and the, and the people who use it, because, you know, you've got a, a couple of layers of managers between you and, and, and the people who are hands on. So I felt this was a way for me to sort of stay connected and stay engaged, which, which I've always found to be quite um, important to me personally. Um, and then the blog ended up taking you know, taking a fair amount of my time, not, not, not all of it. I was still, you know, managing a team at the same time. Um, but eventually it became clear that, that, I mean, that led to opportunities within the organization and, and, you know, working with various teams on sort of more strategic things that, that gave me the opportunity to shift across from a senior manager role into a software architect role, um, where I was sort of in the AutoCAD team, kind of re more responsible for, um, a number of our AutoCAD based verticals. Um, so, and, and still continued with the explorations and the blog, you know, very, very, various things there. So, you know, that was, that, that was, that was good. I mean, I was, it was very strange going from having a team of 30 people or 30, 20, 30 people, I can't even remember now, to having no direct reports at all. So that was a, um, a bit of a shift. And I've ended up kind of, as I mentioned, getting more management responsibility and i wouldn't say reluctantly but it well at the time at the, at the beginning again it was a bit reluctant because i'm like you know i've been a manager i understand what's involved some aspects of it i enjoyed but i really do enjoy technology more you know and and if i can avoid um having to deal with with management related things then then i will but you know in the end i i accepted to sort of do it I have a small team who are, who are very good I'm managing a couple of managers who who are junior managers that I can sort of help help tutor them or help mentor them rather, um, and and but they themselves have small teams, so it's it's not a huge burden. Um, but I suppose the overall thing is that you know there've been missteps perhaps in some ways. You know I've gone into certain areas that maybe I you know I may not have been as interesting as, as I necessarily thought they would be. Um, but overall, I can't be unhappy with the path I've taken. And I do think that the, the main learning I would say from this time um, is that I probably done well to stay focused on what I found to be motivating and important rather than listening to other people who have their own perspective on 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 what an appropriate career path is um and you know like i could be doing my best to to become um you know to have an empire of people under me and you know to try and build out a, a large organization but that's not what has made you know makes me get out of bed in the morning and, and get gets excited i tend to get excited by you know, engaging with a community on technology and 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 um, having influence and speaking to to customers, but not necessarily, um, you know, having that responsibility for 
hundreds of people or, or you know so i'm yeah i'm i'm pretty happy uh you know i've i've had a good so far had a good career at autodesk i mean i would never have imagined i'd be here 26 years later nearly you know 26 it was 26 in august um but that's you know that's the thing is i've changed it's 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 kept fresh because i'm always doing something different um and i do think that where i've landed in in research is quite a good fit for my interests and um yeah long may it last you know and strange as that may sound yeah and like especially like i'm curious to know your thoughts when when you are on a career path which you don't find any role model or a precedent how do you carve out your journey like yeah that's really hard because i mean well so again there isn't yeah there was no path i mean as i said i wear multiple hats and even have kind of multiple titles because not one of them really reflects quite what i do um properly uh i did try and change my role a few you know well five years ago and i kind of did you know it, it changed my the, the my title to be a platform architect and evangelist because i felt that that was aspirationally where i wanted to be and what i was kind of because i really care about platforms and building out platforms for our developer community and our customers and, and i'd like talking about them so you know there's this sort of evangelism piece that comes in um so that that was kind of i mean it is my unofficial title i don't know if it's if it's in our internal systems i think what my you know that's changed anyway but but what i would say um back to your question is it's not easy to i mean if if i wanted to get my job at another company they'd laugh at me i think if i said you know this is what i want to do because i don't even fit really into a particular job as as we have it here in the role that i'm in but i'm able to sort of do it for various reasons um but it's it's it has been a journey and it's not been there hasn't i mean the lack of a role model is one thing i don't really you know i i have people that i admire and, and consider role models um who only do pieces of you know who are more focused on certain areas that i do um so i think that the, from that side i've always had inspiration it's just not there isn't another one of me doing all those the things that i'm interested in if that makes sense um so yeah but but there is there is risk with that as well right in the sense that you end up being um a little bit you know this sounds really bad when i actually saying i'm saying it in my head and it's i don't really don't probably don't want to say it out loud but i mean you end up being you know unique and i don't mean to yeah. say that in a in an arrogant way but there aren't other people around you doing what you do which which means that there's opportunity there because you have a unique skills skill set as long as that skill set and that combination of skills together is valued um but if you're if somebody was to come and look at one aspect of what i do then they would say well you're not really you know you're not a 10 on that you're a 7 um and we need somebody who's a 10 right mm -hmm. so and that's where it 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 is tricky because it really depends where you end also being in a big company you can be moved around um sometimes you can you you know you you can be involved in the decision making process but you're not always um, and it really depends on how receptive your new organization is to accommodating your skill set um so it's it's not uh it's not always easy but again it's just you just have to I mean, for me the visibility that i have through social media and the blog and what have you i i think is beneficial because i think that it it sort of already makes just as you went through you know some blog posts of mine to get a better sense of what i'm what i'm interested in and what i'm working on um it's very obvious you know if you spend enough time you know what i'm up to um so that's uh, i think a good thing <laughs> uh, yeah yeah like 
the like one of the thing like when i read books or read more about like the role model is uh, many times one could learn the possible uh, things they did and like potentially avoid mistakes but there's always some learning from mistakes uh, it goes like both way so i'm very curious to know based on your travel experience or career experience are there any like moments of self realization or pivotal moments of that change your perspective um i mean lots really i i mean i think i was aware of a lot of you know yeah i mean going back to travel i mean i i i'm so glad we did that trip when we did you know that big trip it was just like the best thing ever it was absolutely exhausting i was so tired coming back from uh-huh. it because you know we we did i forget what it, how many countries six, 16 or 17 countries in the space of six months you know moving every few days a lot of the time from one place to another and while we had some structure in place beforehand we didn't have everything planned out we had major flights from between countries sort of organized but in between there's a lot of logistics to deal with so i was always having to go on you know booking.com or airbnb or you know look for looking at campsites because we had all our camping gear with us in as well um so it was a great thing that we did and the world has changed now at least for the moment which which would have it would be very hard to do what we did right now i think it's starting to get easier um but i think the opportunity for the kids was huge but i was not the one pushing for that i i was very much um open to it i also saw a lot of downsides you know in terms of well how am i going to keep doing my job even at a reduced amount over that period you know how are we going to organize all the you know the the detailed stuff as we go along um but luckily my wife pushed um you know she had the she was the visionary um once again so i'm i'm very often not the visionary but in this case you know i sort of think about her as being the general and i was more the foot soldier who was kind of having to um well maybe the sergeant major anyway i, I don't know i was somewhere in there maybe it been not right but i was involved in making it happen but not necessarily um driving it and i think that that has been um you know that that i i acknowledge that it really helps to have somebody who is a visionary alongside you that can help drive you know your focus and to help perhaps look at the bigger picture when you're you feel like yourself you know it's stuck a little bit in the weeds you know having to deal with the day-to-day things so for me that was actually um uh, an interesting realization it was very frustrating at times as well because of course you know the people who have the bigger picture I don't always want to be bothered by the details um you know whereas the details is 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 our world you know for those of us who are stuck in the trenches um so it's an interesting balance an interesting challenge of you know reconciling those two those two visions of 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 things um but yeah i mean it's not to say i don't um believe that perhaps i'll and end up becoming more visionary at some point as i as as i as i grow up um but for now um yeah that's that's so I, that's one learning i think was probably an interesting one i would say i see and is there any book or movie that made that made a big impact in your life um i any one book i mean i read a a, a lot um mainly uh science fiction because i i th- i think as a as a genre it's it's absolutely important for technologists or anybody to be involved in technology to to i mean for me it's a massive source of inspiration and thinking you know it just sort of helps um reframe the the way things you know things are or could be and and just to help you imagine things that are you know a, a different state for the world so i find that extremely valuable even now and i, I mean there's lots of any one book i mean professionally 
some of them have had an impact especially the ones that are thinking more about um you know next generation interfaces in some way that talk about you know, you know the way things could be different with vr and the metaverse i mean you know etc so of course any anything by neil stevenson and uh, you know we talk about snow crash of course a lot these days because of you know th its introduction of the metaverse and, and other things but also diamond age and how he you know has imagined the the a potential um situation where where uh, production is is very much become becomes much more local um and and you know you have feeds of different um raw materials coming through and feed, you know but a lot of people have you know imagine that kind of space and um anyway so i am um, i do appreciate neil De uh, neil stevenson william gibson uh ian e m banks i mean ugh, honestly that if 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 there's any one series of books that i well you know i have started to reread them again for the second time i think second or third time uh recently but the culture books you know ian e. m banks is just was 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 an amazing amazing man uh and just wrote some fantastic um science fiction and traditional fiction as well um I also like, you know, I, again, I, I have a really soft spot for anything that Terry Pratchett wrote when he was alive as well. So, I mean, I, I, I discovered him just as he'd written his second uh, Discworld book, you know, The Light Fantastic, which is the first one I read. And then I realized that I'd missed The Color of Magic. And then ever all the way along, you know, I bought them as he wrote them um, and just sort of just just such a fantastic way of, of seeing things. And that's also been more light relief than anything, but there, there's been some, you know, interesting things I've, I've got from those as well. I mean, movies, I, I do consume quite a lot of movies. I get a lot of, um, so, so uh, one thing that I've been trying to do on a regular basis now is, um, is, you know, go down into my basement and get on, get on my spinning bike and sort of do that. And so I, I found it to be quite a good way to just sort of put on a, a Netflix show or movie. Um, so I, I have been kind of watching quite a bit in recent months, I would say. Um, but yeah, it's a, uh, any one movie that's been really important is really hard to put my, um, you know, put my finger on because there are just so many and so many different areas. Um, I, I've been interestingly consuming a lot of sort of Scandinavian uh, TV and 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 films as well. Uh, for some reason, there's something very uh, appealing about the, the 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 kind of drama and and stuff that gets created in in particularly in Denmark and Sweden. Um, but yeah, that's, uh, that's just I sort of some interests, I suppose. Yeah, it's difficult to pick, pick one option. Uh, so I have last few questions before we end the interview. So uh, how does a day in your life look like? Yeah, so that has been interesting in the sense that it's been very different depending on where I've been in the world and what my role has been. <clears throat> so where I am based at the moment and have been for quite some time is, is Switzerland. So I'm in Europe, um, which means that for me and working with the teams that I work with close, most closely, my mornings are almost completely free of meetings, um, which is just fantastic. You know, it means I can really dig down, dig deep and, and, get, and, and start to research particular topics or, or, or make good headway. On, on problems, sometimes catch up on, on email. I mean, all right, so, so let's put it a different way. The first thing I do when I wake up is when I'm still in bed and probably this is a big no-no, but I usually turn on my phone <laughs> and I catch up on email and Slack and social media notifications and things like that. So that's, you know, and then I'll go down, have breakfast with my, with my family. Um, they'll go off to school. Mostly the kids go off to school quite early. Um, most of them are out the door by seven or seven 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 or seven thirty um and then i can usually get on with with my uh you know clear mornings full of 
you know, coding or research or exploration or preparing presentations, etc. Um, lunch with the family, um, those that come home at lunchtime. I mean, often when I do exercise, it's sometime in the morning. So I'll often try and get an hour or even an hour and a half on the bike uh, in the morning. Um, and then after lunch, I'll... Uh, the, the, the meetings tend to start around 2 to 3 p.m. Um, and then they'll often go during that kind of, I, I'd say the sweet spot where you have, um, uh, you know, the, the, the time zone overlap between Europe, the East Coast and the West Coast is really, it really starts around kind of 4 p.m. or 5 p.m. Um, so often I'll have meetings from around two or three to seven, sometimes eight. I try not to take meetings that are too much later than that because it does impact on, on family life, et cetera. Um, but those will be my, my meeting day, meet, meeting times. I mean, sometimes when I'm really engaged in, in a particular topic or, or, or problem, then I'll go back and start to work uh, a bit after that as well. So my days can end up being quite long um, but that's also why I try and take some time in the morning because it's kind of in anticipation of the fact that they just the days do stretch um, but yeah so I that's I mean I have a fair amount of, of, of freedom in the sense I'm also flitting across multiple projects um, I've very much been involved been enjoying um, working with uh, Rhys Goldstein on on the Vassa project which the, that he's kind of um, instigated on which is kind of the, the 3D version of space analysis that was another project that he was at the center of um, so that's been really interesting and sort of you know building that to, to uh, compiling it using Imscript and to to create a web assembly package that can be loaded into forge or format um, so I've been having a lot of fun kind of uh, you know again adjacencies you know things that kind of are working in a certain space you know what are the possibilities if you can get them working um somewhere else uh and you know what does how does that change the 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 landscape yeah so yeah so those um that's my day i suppose an average day i see and like which city is in your travel bucket list um, so where would I like, well, at the moment, no, you know, I'd actually really like to, to like to visit Iceland. Um, so that's, that's a, a, a place that hasn't, has a significant amount of appeal to me and I haven't yet had the chance. I mean, I have traveled fairly widely, um, else. I mean, yeah, it's, it, for me, travel is, is can be very enjoyable but I I've had to do enough of it for work over the years uh -huh. that it's rarely something that I you know I also live in Switzerland which is like the, one of the most beautiful countries in the world so I, I I've I don't have as as much of a desire to travel as perhaps I, I, I once did you know we can in the winters we go we're snowboarding or every weekend you know, so we, we're up in the mountains to making the most of that. In the summer, we, we live three minute walk, a three minute walk from the lake, you know, where you can windsurf or kayak or whatever. I mean, it's just, I, I, I'm so happy with where I live that I'm, I almost don't. And I also enjoy my work so, so much that I, I kind of don't have a major need to disconnect uh -huh. and to, to go somewhere else i mean that said we did just have a really great uh, 10 day holiday in sardinia so you know the the island off italy where we did scuba diving for um pretty much the whole time and it that was really nice because we disconnected completely so there was no checking my phone first thing in the morning because the the network connection was so bad that i was mostly disconnected it was unfortunately the, the same week that Autodesk University was happening. So I, oh. I, I ended up not being able to engage much at all with AU this year. Um, but that was actually kind of okay because it was also an all online experience. And um, yeah, I, I, di I didn't find that I missed too much. Yeah. I see. And lastly, 
what is your piece of advice to young professionals who are interested in this adjacent space and like are are very uh, eager to innovate in in this space so um i i think i think kind of be curious you know be open and curious and and look to explore uh you know a, a, a wide range of different areas because i think that is where you're going to um find the opportunity to sort of do interesting things i mean i would say um try and find the right balance for you between uh deep understanding of an area and uh you know having enough information and enough knowledge to to be able to at least understand the implications of of that technology because of course if you you know you it's good to go deep i mean you know i think people talk about t-shaped individuals right so that that's you know, uh -huh. i suppose being t-shaped is a good thing i don't know if i'm really t-shaped um i'm not sure what i what i am but there's there's anyway uh, there's 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 definitely some breadth there uh -huh. but i don't know how far the t goes down and in how many areas as well it's probably anyway it would be i, I don't really think that i'm t-shaped but yeah so be um be curious uh be um you know as a as a kind of saying earlier and the, the the people that hopefully are paying attention to this you know people who are involved in architectural technology there's going to be no shortage of opportunity to use your skills in the coming years i mean if it's it's this you, you're exactly where you should be in in a certain sense you know that there's going to be a massive need for people who understand architecture and how technology might apply to it who um you know can really help make major improvements in the built environment and the, you know to help with automation to help with with solving a lot of the problems that we need to solve in order to you know improve things over the over the coming decades so i don't worry particularly about um a, you know any of your ability to to find jobs in the future um the question is really you know finding the right one and and then applying applying your skills you know in an appropriate way i think it's always there's always learning to be done you know don't ever give up on on learning um you know there there's that you don't necessarily but, but understand how far you need to go that's the thing you know you don't necessarily need to go down to assembly language and machine code to to implement architectural software but having some um you know some software engineering discipline around what you do develop can be can be helpful for sure you know try, try do try to push the limits a little bit in terms of going beyond the low code environments to sort of explore the use of things like python and 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 you know javascript and and even even c++ dare i say but it really depends or or rust or whatever it is that that is you know taking over from c++ these days but um yeah it's it's there's a lot of opportunity stay curious stay hungry um and yeah just yeah, follow as many people as you can on twitter but not too many in a certain you know in the in the wrong area um i should probably do a plug for myself on twitter at this stage but yeah you hopefully it'll be um put in the in the in the link in the comments below etc but for sure i'll i'll add your blog link and twitter id and perfect that's a great piece of advice thanks a lot keen for this amazing session it was quite insightful and thanks for being so honest about all the stories and journeys you have you're very welcome and once again thanks for um thanks for inviting me along you know it's been it's been fun to sort of meet you in person rather than just by well in person or virtually in person um rather than just via social media um and yeah it's keep in touch sure uh, have a nice rest of your evening thank you